Okay, so um, so great. So uh, we're out here. You guys are on Zoom. I'm going to give a quick, uh, super quick overview of the site, and then uh, as normal, because it's it's hard to get good quality streaming on the Zoom, uh, we'll 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 kill this, and you guys will record the rest of our stops and post those to YouTube uh, when I get back to better Wi-Fi, and so you guys can see those. If you guys are at, on Zoom and you're not here, please do make sure to watch those, the rest of the tour kind of thing. Um, so the plan for today is going to be um, uh, sort of two-parted. So first, I want to just talk about Cam Park and, and just the history of this place. So you guys have an understanding of the setting. And then we're going to start on our uh, first bit. Probably not, I don't think we're going to get to finishing it today, but we're going to start on uh, learning about CRAM. The California Rapid Assessment Methodology, and and that's that's basically the plan for today. So a little bit of history, a little bit of starting to do cram, and and uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep going from there next week um, uh, with some virtual stuff because it's because we don't have class next week because of Thanksgiving holiday. So that's the plan. Cool. Any logistics questions before we get going? Okay. So we're so for those of you that are online, we we came through the gate, and so normally you guys can come here. Normally you guys can, at this time of day, the, the yellow gate would be open here and you could come on in. This is a, this is a open to everybody uh, recreational park, a riparian park, um, but because of, uh, and you guys can actually still come here. You could jog here, you could, uh, when I was out here doing the, um, if you guys watched my, hopefully you did, watch my aerial tour videos, you heard the clip, clop, 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 there's all these horses walking past us, so you could ride your horses in here, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's just because we're trying to minimize people congregating, that's why the gate is closed now. Normally, the gate is only closed uh, nighttime. So dawn to dusk, this, this, this facility, this park is open to the public. Um, and so that's the situation. So if you guys that didn't come on, you guys weren't able to come on our uh, trip to today, if you did want to come out here, for some reason you haven't been here yet, you could come here on the weekend, et cetera. The only constraint currently is that uh, the area just immediately outside the gate, um, you're not allowed to park there. So, so you would need to park somewhere else on campus or whatever, and then walk here. But, but assuming you can do that, it's 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 open. Okay, so that's logistics. Uh, and then also one more logistic thing, just to remind everybody. So this is still camp a campus facility. Talk about the history in a second. But this is a campus facility, and uh, therefore you need a campus you need a parking permit to be here. So that's why we had the, the silliness of people buying parking permits. I shouldn't say silliness, no. As a representative of the university, I need to say that parking is not is not supported by the state. All the parking stuff is supported, self-supported. So you should pay for parking permits and not park illegally. Uh, check, okay, so I said that. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so that, there we go. So this is, so here we go. So I wanna first start, any, any logistics questions before we get going though about that? Anything about? Okay, yeah. How far are we like walking? How far are we walk today? Don't know exactly. I think you know we're gonna meander for um, you know a mile or something like that. So we're not gonna we're not we won't necessarily see our cars. So if you guys have some, I'd lock up your cars. But but we're not gonna be going hundreds of miles or anything. But we will be out of uh, sort of just meandering around looking at different things, looking at different elements. Okay. And by show of hands, who has not been here before? Has anybody not been here before? One. Man, anybody, anybody online, anybody not been here before? I've never been there. Dana's never been here. Okay, cool. Well, that was, a, that was an a-hole thing to say. I just like, hey, you guys, give me some feedback. And then I mocked the answer. What a what an a-hole teacher. Okay, so uh, two, anybody else? Okay. I haven't been. Okay, so three, anybody I've else? Been. I've never been. Four, five, okay, all right. Okay, so there's several you guys haven't been. Okay, so great. So whenever... Whenever we're done with the pandemic, I really do encourage, and before you guys graduate, I certainly encourage you guys to come out here. We're not going to have time to do a full, complete site tour today, um, but there's a lot of really interesting things here. Uh, ESRM related, uh, cultural history related, um, all that kind of good stuff. And actually, so I see people glancing at me. So let me, let's switch right now because you guys, you guys don't stare in the sun. You, let me stare in the sun. Let, let's switch. How about that? Okay. Is that better for you guys? Site-wise, okay, all right. Okay, so great. So first let me do um, 
I'll, I'll do a more, I'll talk about more detailed history when we start walking around and stuff, but let me just give everybody the quick overview so you understand this particular site. So this, uh, this area, firstly, I call it Cam Park. You'll see in all the modules and everything, I keep referencing Cam Park, but then sometimes I put parentheses, AKA University Park. So campus uh, has been trying to rebrand this as University Park, this, this region where we are. And you know that, that's totally fair, but I'm old. And for you know 15 years, I called it Cam Park. Uh, Cam Park stood for, was an abbreviation for Camarillo Regional Park. And so I usually just keep calling it Cam Park because in some of the, some of the universities where I work, they have university parks. And so it, it's just a, for my own organizing of files and stuff, it's, it's a more distinctive name for me to call it Cam Park, but realize that if you were to search Currently, old documents, you'd search for Camarillo Park or Camarillo Regional Park. Currently, anything on, on the university website, you'd search for university, CSUCI webpage, you'd search for university parks. Okay, so that's a little bit of confusion there. Um, okay, cool. So let's talk about uh, the quick 10-minute uh, view of this, or the, of this site. So this was, uh, so we're in a riparian corridor here. So those of you guys that are home, uh, you hopefully have seen the videos, but as I turn this, Right, so we have Cayugas Creek right here. We have this, and we're at the, obviously the toes of the Santa Monica's, and then we have this big floodplain here that goes from the main channel to the, to the hills. And so this area uh, has been, uh, well, the, the broad area. So from here out down to, you know, past Round Mountain, um, historic, uh, used by the Chumash people and, and in and around here and, and fishing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this particular chunk though is interesting because it's right where the, you know, so obviously we're right literally at the toe. We're literally at the edge of the Santa Monica mountains. And so this is the first point really where, where the Cayugas Creek, the river, the, the, the modern river channel just is sort of starting to hug the mountains. So we have this pretty well-defined area between the main channel and the, the beginning of the, the slope of the hills here, um, this, this broad plain, this, this alluvial plain, this flood plain. And so that's what's attracted people, right? One of the things about flood plains are very fertile. So for example, we just look across the way, we see tons of, of ag, right? So the same factors that are making the Oxnard Plain very fertile and desirous for, um, uh, I should check. You guys can hear me okay online, yeah? Volume-wise? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Sorry, somebody say something? No, we said yes. We can hear oh, you. Oh, yeah, okay, good. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, so, anyway, so we have this, the, the deposition of the sediment and making it nice and fertile and, and good to grow stuff, which is great. Obviously, native plants, not just not just cultivated things, but, but uh, uh, you know, all kinds of vegetation grows really well here. We have a water source, right? We're a semi-arid area. So this water source is important for augmenting wildlife populations, et cetera. The other thing that's maybe not as quite as appreciated is not only does that floodplain drop off stuff, it tends to act to level things. So the area right on floodplains tends to be pretty flat. And so when we humans colonize an area and we come to a spot, the easiest thing to do is, you know, we could go pack out 17 terraces on that hillside that'll take us 20 years, or we could just put our houses right here on the flat area. We tend to put our infrastructure, our concentrate our activities in the flat area. So this, this flat area between the river and the, um, and the hills was a, a very, uh, you know, contained, compartmentalized, easily targeted area. And so it's been used, it's been targeted for different activities over the years. Uh, one of the first, is that one of us? Oh, oh yeah, so you can just, yeah. Loretta, it's open. You can just, you can just push the gate open. What? You can just push the gate open and drive in and then just close it after you're done. Okay, uh, what was I saying? Okay, so, um, uh, okay, so, so uh, uh, various activities going on here. And then let's, flash forward to the early part of the 1900s. So um, at that point in time, uh, we didn't have what we would currently call mental hospitals, right? We had, oh, thank you. We had um, what people would call uh, 
uh, sanatoriums or 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 madhouses or things of this nature, right? So people will be stuffed into dark, horrible places that, um, you know, we're we're just sequestered from society. No real, no real tending to people's mental health or whatever. And so right around this time, in the turn of the turn of 1800s, 1900s, what started becoming in vogue was this notion that hey, maybe we can take a different approach to mental health. And so long story short, that leads to the creation of this network across California of um, uh, mental hospitals, uh, mental health facilities. This is one of them. And so, but when that happened, but when that happened, there's still this, we, I mean, we obviously still have stigma with mental health in our society, but, but back then it's still, especially, it was still a major stigma. So when they were looking for places to locate mental health facilities, you know, there's this one movement that we should do things differently, but they were still dealing with all this cultural baggage and all this, this fear of, and, and sort of disdain for people that have um, mental health challenges. And so the idea was they were looking for places, Camarillo became a perfect spot. So they could come out here, we could put a mental health facility, it could be a quote unquote modern facility, but it's also out here where nothing else is here, right? So they could hide people out here, right? So you could be a Hollywood person, have your, have your mental health breakdown and come out here and, and, you know, in a sense, hide. So that meant when they picked this site, they were picking it to be out of sight, out of mind. There was nothing around. So they had to put in their own, uh, you know, elect, uh, power plant, which, which eventually became our modern power plant. They had to put in, you know, water distribution for all these things. Out here at Cam Park, what they put in was the food generation facility. So this place was first majorly transformed by when our campus started. So our campus opens in 1934. Uh, and so in the lead up to that, uh, uh, one for budgetary reasons, one because they were trying to make these things as autonomous as possible. Two, because it was just kind of out here in the country and far away from urban supply networks they decided they wanted to, as much as possible, have the hospital produce its own food for the, for the patients. And so on the far area, on, on uh, close, closer, so we're on the part sort of towards Camarillo Street. On the opposite end, we have what you guys know as the scary dairy. So that was put in for a couple of things. That was put in for chickens, for eggs, and I, I guess meat, but primarily for the, for the eggs. And then, and then cattle, dairy cattle, not for slaughter, but for, for milk. And so those facilities went over there. They were staffed. I mean, there was obviously, you know, people in charge, but um, patients provided a lot of the labor. So it was both a way to, to generate food out here, but also a bit of therapy, right? Give, give people stuff to do, give them associated with, with animals. One of the other things I'll say, and then I'll stop talking about the mental hospital. Um, one of the other things, that, one of the things that, that made our facility such a modern advance, when you guys read about it now, people talk about it as like this very you know, scary mental hospital and it's super haunted and there's all these, you know, they did lobotomies and all this kind of stuff. But at the time, and electroshock and all these things that we now think are horrible, but at the time, it was very forward thinking. They were trying to innovate new things to help people. Um, maybe they didn't get down the right path, but, but it was very much so trying um, an area of experimentation and an area of trying to improve people's lives. Uh, and so what, the reason why our campus looks the way our campus looked was the other part of this new approach to mental hospitals, which is that all the patients should be able to go out into nature. So there's this belief that wildness, that natural landscapes, that natural settings are helpful for our mental health, which was very forward thinking, you know, 120 years ago. Um, and so the idea was everybody should be able to go out in nature. If they can't go out in the nature, maybe because they are a danger to themselves or others or something like that, they should at least be able to see nature. So, so therefore, um, uh, that's why they, did, they picked the style of the missions for, you know, they could have made our, our campus Lego blocks or whatever, right? And they said the missions are great because the missions, one, are, are, very energy efficient, right? So we have these big thermal mass walls and all these other things. Um, two, it's keeping with our local character, our local architectural character. But then three, really what it meant was because everything was in these quads and things, a patient who was maybe not able to come out here or not able to go out and sit on the lawn 
could at least look from their window and see the lawn. So, so, um, so anyway, so there was interest in, in having patients be associated with nature and natural land, landscapes, et cetera. Scary dairy only lasts for a little while. You know, by the time we get to the, uh, you know, 50s, it's, it's very obvious. It's, it's more efficient to just buy eggs, right? As opposed to do all the logistic workup. And so the scary dairy gets abandoned. So the structures we have remaining, if you guys, uh, we're probably not gonna get all the way down there today, but if you guys wanna walk down there later, <clears throat> Uh, we have sort of concrete uh, 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 bunker-like things, right? That are all graffitied up now. We have the big, large barn, the three-story uh, uh, hay barn uh, that was that was essentially feed storage for for the critters. And then we have some other areas that were um, essentially the troughs where they where they sort of had the animals kept. So that's what remains. Much of the many of the buildings have been taken down. The stuff that does remain. Uh, oh, okay, we'll talk about that in a second. But, but the stuff that does remain has still been used. Most, uh, typically, it's used as a training facility. It's used as a training facility for Ventura County sheriffs when they're training for hostage rescue. It's used by the fire uh, Ventura County Fire when they're we're trying to practice you know, getting into buildings and things of that nature. Um, so, so there is value to this uh, place, even though it's sort of abandoned, as it were, uh, now. Okay, so... Okay, so we have, we have the, the mental hospital is here and the mental hospital finishes up and when we stop needing to produce our food, uh, this area is like, we don't really need this area anymore. So it goes into, it, it, it degrades back to um, uh, federal control, federal lands, okay? Nothing much happens for a long time, but there is huge, as with many of our restoration sites we're talking about in our course, there's huge pressure to do something with the, with the land. So, so there's a proposal to turn this into a golf course. There's a proposal to turn this into an amphitheater, a music venue, so that you know the sort of the hillsides would be where we sat and the performers would be sort of out in the flatlands kind of thing. Um, there's a proposal to put in a federal prison here. Um, and so all these things kind of happen and don't really fully happen. The one that has the, mo the most uh, conspicuous uh, legacy for us right now is the federal prison because they start to do some initial planning and they do some initial dirt moving around and they make a big pad where they might put some of the initial buildings with the idea of maybe doing some surveying, that kind of stuff. That, that doesn't happen. This is in the 70s. That doesn't happen. But that pad becomes the Condor airfield. So when the Condors come in later, we'll talk about them when they come in, they they you'll you'll see that the the or you just see from the pictures or the videos I've made, the airfield, the airstrip, the model airplane airstrip isn't level with the floodplain. It's it's about five, six feet higher, right? So it's on fill. And that that construction part was done for the uh, 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 um, potential prison or part of the potential prison. Okay, so nowadays that would be problematic because that is on wet, jurisdictional wetland and it would have filled a wetland and been a problem. Okay, so there we go. So then continuing on, uh, this I said 10 minutes, man, I'm going on 15. Wow, what a classic professor, what a classic Dr. A move. Okay, so um, so then we're, so we're advancing forward. So what's going on? So, okay, so we're coming forward, coming forward. Then <clears throat> we get to the 1980s. The 1980s is the birth of the modern conservative movement. We now think of the, of the conservative movement in terms of having actual power. President Ronald Reagan is elected in 1980 and ushers in this massive change in how we deal with public lands, uh, environmental resources, things of that nature. So one of the things in the context of our conversation here today, one of the things he does is he, he sides with um, the Sagebrush Rebellion. You guys, you guys remember that from any of your previous classes? The so Sagebrush Rebellion is, nowadays you think of Eamon, you know, the Bundys and the folks that take over the Mahir Wildlife Refuge and they graze their cattle in Utah and Nevada and say, we don't have to pay fees because we're the original owners because Native Americans don't exist. The, that, that crew, those, those folks. Um, so so they, were in, they were starting to rise up in the late seventies. And when Reagan came into power, he said, hey, I'm you. And so he started saying things like um, the scariest words in the American language are I'm from the government and here to help. So this notion that the government is evil, folks running the government say that government is evil. And obviously those forces have only grown, grown stronger uh, 
as you all know from current events. Um, but so one of the things that Reagan does is he says, let's get rid of protected areas. Let's get rid of national parks and things of this nature. Now, he doesn't come out and say, let's get rid of all national parks. But he says, you know what? Stuff is better under local control. So he starts this, 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 this um, project. But because there's still actual power on both sides back in the 80s, what happens is, so, so the Reagan administration says, we want to sell off federal lands. The other side of the aisle pushes back and says, whoa, 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 let's be careful. They're very afraid that we'll sell off Yosemite or, or, or some parcel in Yosemite or on the edge of Yosemite. We'll sell it to a county government, let's say. And the county government will hold it for six months and sell it to a developer. And all of a sudden you'll have some big mega hotel or, or private ranch or something like that, right? So, so what they say is in the selling of the land, um, uh, you have to, uh, 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 so, so we'll, we'll sell the land to a local government, state, county, local jurisdiction. They have to pay for it, but it's, it's bargain basement prices. It's massively cheap, right? But we'll sell it to them. But then only they can have it. If that agency or that entity or that government in turn wants to then resell that land, it has to be approved by the previous federal owners of that land. So, no, so the idea being that if we sold off a little part of Yosemite to, to a county, county government, and the county government said, hey, we want to we want to put a, a uh, I don't know, a handicap accessible fishing area here or something. Right. So they said, OK, and we sold it to them. And then also they said, yeah, no, actually, we want to sell to this millionaire. Uh, uh, they couldn't do that. They would have to get the permission of the feds in addition to doing it. So the idea would be we wouldn't we wouldn't be a wholesale getting rid of of, of public lands to private interests. OK, so that happens here. So as soon as Reagan starts that, that, that procedure, people in Ventura County go, yo, we want this land. And so there's a bond measure passed and the, city, the, the county of Ventura passes a bond. They, so they tax themselves to raise the money. It's, so I don't remember the exact, I should know off the top of my head, but you know, it's crazy times, COVID and all. So I think, it's, I think it was like $187,000 or something like that. So it's, it's over 350 acres here, right? So a, a you know, couple hundred thousand dollars for hundreds and hundreds of acres is ridiculously cheap, right? You can never do that now. Um, but, so, so, but they do that, they get permission, they purchase this area that we're gonna be walking around today from the feds and, it, and that's when it becomes officially quote unquote Camarillo Regional Park. So it's part of our, our, our park network in the county. Immediately, this is a big area. This is relatively far away from most people. It's still near the active mental hospital. So some people are still afraid of that kind of stuff. So, you know, so it's not, it's not a very popularly attended park. It's remote, it's hard to, to get to, et cetera, right? And so as a consequence, it's never really heavily used. We have the old dairy, you know, you kids are coming out smoking your marijuana and doing your drugs. And so it's just one of the, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's a hard thing to manage, right? It's kind of, it becomes a nuisance. And so the county really quickly is like, oh man, we don't wanna, oh, geez. <laughs> right? So um, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff we'll talk about in the tour. We'll talk about the levees and things like that. But, <clears throat> but to, end our, to end our conversation, where, where the, this, this current trajectory of this place happens, CSUCI comes into being, right? And so late 90s, so 1997, the mental, hospital officially shutters, start, begins a transition to CSUCI. Um, and very early on, we start this conversation, hey, it'd be great to get this, get this property, right? Not to develop, not to turn into a chemistry building, but just to have for exactly what we're doing here. Some of you guys have had field methods activities out here, cons bio activities out here, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so we start the process, but because of this legacy of how things have to be approved, it took forever. So when I when I first came here in 2004, I was like, "Hey, can we can we do some restoration stuff here, or whatever?" And the answer was, "Totally. It's, it might might take a year or two. It ended up taking about another 12 years or so, or 10 years or so. Um, and so it took that long because it was the CSU wanted to buy it. That meant CSUCI had to buy it. 
which meant the CSU system, the massive bureaucracy that the CSU system had to approve it. And then we're a state agency, then the state had to approve it. And then it had to go to the Department of the Interior, right? The Park Service, the, the entity that, that historically had the say here. And then it was just a, something would change. And then it would have to go all, propagate all the way back. And then these guys would change it. So it took years and years and years. Long story short, we ended up purchasing it. We paid the county back their original, whatever it was, $187,000. And so we are now the owners of this. As we took ownership, um, all these, and this is a, a real challenge for our restoration, uh, our restoration challenges, right? So when we have a degraded site, some people start doing whatever the hell they want, right? And they get used to doing whatever the hell they want in the ways they wanna do it. When we talk about returning function, bringing back endangered species or other things, that sometimes means these folks that have gotten used to doing their due for five, 10, 15, 20 years might have to change. And sometimes they don't like that. Sometimes they don't like that. So um, uh, yeah, maybe I'll save that for as we start walking around, but, but long story short, CSUCI did a really poor job of that, of managing that transition. It's one of the reasons that we pulled up, Loretta and you guys are like, oh, can we put in a, can I, can I pay for this? And it's sort of like a not great parking kiosk. And there isn't, and, and it, it, there's a whole bunch of reasons why, why not, not much has happened out here short of putting in a little gate and this and that. And that's because we've botched the stakeholder engagement. We've done a poor job of engaging with the public. And yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that to start with. So that's it. So, so here we are. So here we are at Camp Park. Where we stand now, we have this floodplain that's relatively healthy, right? Way healthier than that orchard over there, right? So relatively well functioning, but it's it's severed, it's cut off from the, from the typical inundation from the river by this levee that had, that had already been established by the time the, the mental hospital went in. So this, this levee was in in the early 1900s. Um, so we have this constrained hydrologic goings on here. We have, a sort of passive management really, right? Not really actively trying to control invasives, not really actively trying to do one thing or another. And that's led to this culture of basically this site, you can do whatever the hell you want with, right? You can go smoke out over there and go do paintball wars over there and go right off trails over there. And that's a huge challenge when we talk about planning for restoration and how might we go forward and what are the options. Um, since I'm gonna sign off in a second for you guys, I'll just say that the, the general conceptual approaches to restoring this site mostly talk about taking down the levee or modifying the levee to allow water to flood in over in this floodplain. Because the elevations are about what they historically should be, we don't have to do any massive, you know, it's not like some of our restorations where, where we have to completely excavate all the area or bring in a thousand yards of whatever. It's, it's, mo it's, pretty, it's a pretty straightforward restoration, which is allow the hydrology to do what the hydrology wants to do. And so we're going to walk around now and see some of those things. And then we're going to turn and start to talk about CRAM. So I'll just finish up real briefly with a quick intro to CRAM for folks before I log off, folks that are online. Um, and so again, I apologize. Uh, oh, the good news is we got, I got the rat out of the house. So that was cool. So <laughs> sorry for bailing on last week's lecture. My wife was like, get in here. I'm like, I'm teaching a class. She's like, get in here. I'm like, I'm teaching a class. And she's like, Get the hell in here right now! I'm like what? So anyway, long story short, it was a wood rat. It was a native. That was cool. That was cool. But uh, um, yes, we we like to leave doors open in our house, and sometimes other things like to come in and say hi. hi. Um, so we didn't get to really talk too much about cram, but in my module, I have a lot of intro to it. Um, long story short, California Rapid Assessment Methodology developed for California here, developed for wetlands, quickly applied to both wetlands and riparian areas and then quickly modified for the, the, the different subtypes, different categories of wetlands that we have around. Um, it's been very useful, very helpful. I was again, very skeptical of this. We talked about this when we talked about reference conditions. I was like, so again, the idea is uh, uh, at your office, do some background stuff, look at Google Earth, that kind of stuff, sort of get a, get a mile high view of the system, come out, do a very brief visit, hour, two hour, you know, that kind of thing. Jot down some stuff. Does this look, you know, it, good, bad, or indifferent? Check. Good, bad, or indifferent? Check. You know, it's not like you're sitting there for 12 years measuring precisely all that stuff. It's very much so bins. 
oh, is this, is this, is, are there trees here? Are there shrubs here? Like that level of stuff. And you, and you, you, you go through the sheet and you mark things down and then you tally stuff up and create a number. And so I was originally, you know, I was like, what the hell, man, this seems stupid, right? I'm, I'm the nerdy PhD guy that has to be spending years analyzing whether this is well functioned or not. This is not as good as, as doing the stuff that, you know, I would do or you would do at a consulting firm, but it turns out it's actually pretty useful. So even though it's not as good, it still has a really, really vital role to play, particularly when we're trying to figure out where to spend money. So if you're an agency, if you're, if you're, uh, I don't know, the CSU or something, and you have a bunch of these protected areas and you say, hey, we got an extra, got an extra million dollars this year. Which one should we spend it on? You could say, which one will we get the most bang for the buck on? We could say, which one has been most historically neglected, whatever. And we start talking about multiple sites. You need some way to, you need some apples to apples comparison, right? And so CRAM has really become very useful for that apples to apples comparison. So it's most useful at the mile high view. How are we doing as a state with our wetlands? Good, bad, not changing very much. Where should we prioritize action? Where should we prioritize spending? Um, you can use CRAM for tracking the recovery of a wetlands. We do our restoration and use it as the, as the performance measure. Not as great at that, but you can use it for that. But really it's most valuable in this overview, this synoptic setting where, how is Ventura County doing in terms of its wetlands? How is Southern California doing in its will? So it actually is a quite valuable tool. It is really useful. And, um, and, and it is, again, that, 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 that range I gave you before, it's, it's called a tier two, right? So it's a rapid assessment. It's not the detailed one that we would spend years and hundreds of thousands of dollars on, but, it's, but it still has value. So that's CRAM. And so we're gonna start talking about CRAM today as we walk around. Cool. So that's a little bit about the site, a little bit about CRAM intro. Any any. For you guys here can ask me questions, but anybody online, you guys making sense? Any questions? Good. Okay. So, um, so because there's no real place to sit down and, and put a thing for people to do sign in sheet, I said an announcement before we, before class today, uh, that just said as a quick link to a quick Google form. It just says your name and did you did you come in person? Did you just attend on Zoom or were you not able to come either? If you guys just fill that out for me. Um, if you, you guys online do it now and we log off, but it, but everybody else, you guys can just do it, you know, before the end of the day. And then I'll just, that that's my sign in sheet for today. Cool. All right, great. So that's, so we're just going to walk around and do some activities and stuff. You guys make sure you watch the videos and, and take our quiz. We have a quiz, a five question quiz that's due by five today. So take that and I will, uh, so we will have stuff next week, but it'll be virtual. It'll be, it'll be some online stuff next week. So we're not meeting everybody. Be safe. Have a great Thanksgiving. Wash your hands. Try to avoid family gatherings and you guys uh, be safe. Thank you. Thanks you guys.